Hey everyone, well this last month has been great as we have been uh, in Easter mode, thinking about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, what a great series it was. Uh, but because of that, we missed out on the end of our Missing Out series. And so we're gonna get through that today. And, uh, but I do wanna let you know about next week because we're starting a new series in the book of Ephesians and our new lead pastor, Ray Galea, is gonna be here sharing that and it is gonna be fantastic. So make sure you join next week. But as we begin today, I wanna ask you a question. Uh, get thinking, get your minds going to bed, and I wanna ask you about the job that you do, about the role that you have in life and how you spend most of your time, okay? So here's the question. If I were to ask you to communicate with me what you do, what your role is, without using words or actions, you could only use an object or an image, what would that object be? Okay, so think about that a little bit, uh, and let's look at some examples here. Um, a calculator. W what do you think of when you see a calculator? Maybe an accountant? Maybe a math teacher? <laughs> uh, yeah, like that's a common image, right? How about this next one? A hard hat. All right, I used to wear a hard hat every summer when I was in university because I did construction. Construction work, maybe an engineer, they often wear hard hats as well. Uh, here's another one. Oh, we used to have lots of these in our, in our house uh, when we were in Canada when my wife worked as a nurse. Right, scrubs, you often think of a nurse or a surgeon, that's often the, uh, the image, the uniform, right? Uh, here's another one. All right, I know that they don't actually use them like, that. they don't look like this anymore, but a cash register, you know, you know right? Um, maybe someone in sales, lots of people work in sales, maybe this object is it. Okay, this next one's really important though, you better get this one right. What is it? Okay, a cape. Who wears a cape? Yeah, mom wears a cape, right? Moms, you are super women. Uh, we love you. That is your role, and the cape is your object. And lastly, uh, we should all get this one as well, uh, a pillow. What do you think of when you see a pillow? Everyone thinks about students. Yes, because students love to sleep. <laughs> Isn't it interesting to think about, though, how every job, every profession, every role has an object or an image associated with it, and those images, you know, you may think of those, look at those, and you may think, this is great, I love my job, I love that image. Sometimes you might think, actually, no, I don't like my job, and this actually makes me a little angry or anxious right now. Uh, but when we work for as many hours as we do in life, uh, and we work as hard as we do, the reality is that these images, these objects, can kind of become identity markers for us, can't they? They can become the primary way that we see ourselves, what we do, and who we are. But today, we're gonna to think about this. Why does God have us in Dubai? Or wherever in the world that you're watching from, where you live, how does God see us? And why does he have us in the place that we are for this season of our lives? And we see uh, actually this purpose that we're talking about, and we see a unique object, an image associated with it, an amazing chapter of the Bible in John chapter 13. And so let's explore that today and see why does God have us where we are? So John 13 starts like this. It was just before the Passover festival, and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And the evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. All right, so here's the setting. Jesus and his disciples are sitting down for a meal, and it's actually the last meal they're going to share together. And Jesus recognizes that his, his season on earth and the reason that he's come is coming to an end on earth. And so he finishes up his time and his ministry with what the passage says, with the people who uh, were his own, um, the disciples who he loved. And Jesus knew a few things. He knew three things, it says here in, in verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and secondly, that he had come from God, and that he was returning to God. See, Jesus had status, right? 
all things were under his power, it says. That's a lot of things, right? And what would you do if you had that kind of power? If you knew that everything, you had authority over everything, all things were under your power, what would you do with that? If you could just command anything and it would be done for you. Think about that, what would you do? Well, here's what Jesus did, verse four. He got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing, and he wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. See, knowing that all things were under his power, Jesus picked up a towel, got on his knees, and washed his disciples' feet. Now, I don't know if foot washing is a big thing in the culture where you're from, but where I'm from, you don't touch other people's feet. Like, that's gross, right? But in the first century, foot washing was not an uncommon thing. Actually, hosts would regularly, if they had guests coming from a long distance, they'd put out a basin with some water and a towel so that their feet could be cleaned. This, so it was kind of like an act of hospitality. But to get down on the floor in front of someone and to take off their sandal for them and to physically and personally uh, wash that person's feet, this was a degrading task. And to do so had massive social implications because never, ever, ever would someone from a higher status wash the feet of someone beneath them in society. That would be unthinkable. It's not the same as, as you inviting a friend over, hey, hey, can you come on over and just help me hang a picture on the wall or something? <laughs> this isn't just something you do for friends even, right? This is, this is not a nice gesture. When Jesus took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, do you know what he was doing? He was putting on a uniform. That's right. He was purposely lowering himself by adopting the position and the posture of a servant. Just picture yourself now, sitting there with Jesus and his disciples. You're invited, you're, you're sharing this meal uh, with the one that you serve. How, how humbling is that? How amazing that you get to be a part of this. And imagine watching the one that you serve put a towel around their waist and come around to start washing feet. How would you respond? I'll tell you what, I, I, if I were there, I would sure hope that I wasn't the first person Jesus came to because I would want to see, what's everyone else doing here? <laughs> are, they, are they letting him, right? Uh, but the question is, when he got to you eventually, would you let him? Would you let him, the one you serve, would you let him degrade himself in this way and wash your feet? Well, most of his disciples, what we see here, is they seem to be okay with this, or at least they're not brave enough to speak up about it. But Simon Peter is not. Verse 6, he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Now, this is an objection, and it's an understandable objection because, as we said, Jesus is the one that Simon Peter serves. So this is unacceptable. Um, Peter's like, What's going on here? And the other disciples are probably sitting there thinking like, man, why didn't we say that? I can't believe I let Jesus wash my feet. Way to go, Peter. But Jesus explains to them. Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. He's like, Peter, trust me. I know this is weird. I know, I know this doesn't make sense, but later on you will get it. It will make sense to you. Jesus is so patient with them. Uh, Peter's pretty stubborn though, right? No, Peter says, you shall never wash my feet. Just imagine watching this conversation happen. Uh, this is awkward. Did, did Peter just say no to Jesus? Like, we're not supposed to do that, right? <laughs> but Jesus makes something really clear in this moment. He looks at Peter and he answers, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. See, this is a big deal to Jesus, to be part of him, and by extension, to be part of his kingdom. Jesus says that they need to be washed, but more importantly, they need to be washed by him. Peter finally gets it, finally understands what's at stake. 
Then, Lord, he says, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Peter's like, wow, if by you washing my feet, I get to be a part of your kingdom and part of you, what do I get if you wash more of me? <laughs> He's like, wash my hands, wash my hair. Jesus, my hair is a mess. It's greasy. It could really use a washing. Could you do that for me? And Jesus answers, though, he says, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him and that that was why he said not everyone was clean. Jesus is essentially saying, no, Peter, I'm not going to wash more of you because the cleansing that I provide will fully cleanse you, meaning that you won't need any more washing than that because of what the foot washing symbolizes, which we're going to talk about in just a moment here. But first, look at verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place, and then he asks the most important question. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. And that's the important question for you and I to ask too when we read this passage. Do we understand what Jesus has done? Why did Jesus wash their feet? See, he wasn't just doing something kind. I don't think he was just meeting a need. I don't think he was just sitting there being like, wow, it smells really bad in the room, guys. We got to wash our feet. No one else is going to, fine, I'll do it. I'll go wash your feet. I don't think he was just being nice in this moment. In fact, it wasn't about their feet at all. What was powerful, powerful about this experience was not the foot washing itself, but the role Jesus was assuming by doing it. And what role was that? The role of a servant. When Jesus picked up that towel, wrapped it around his waist, kneeling down to wash his disciples' feet, he was saying, friends, this is my purpose. This is why I've come. This is who I am. I've come to serve. See, if you were to meet Jesus today and say, hey, what do you do? What do you do, Jesus? He wouldn't pick up a crown to show that he rules the world even though he's the king of kings. He wouldn't bring you to his throne room and show you his throne just as if to say, hey, I'm the Lord of Lords even though he is. No. He would pick up a towel, wrap it around his waist as if to say, I am a servant. And if you and I were in that room with him that day eating that meal, he would want to do the same for us, to wash our feet to humbly serve us. Well, this is where things get real. Because we might have really dirty feet. Um, the disciples likely had really dirty feet. They, they wore sandals in a dusty, dirty land. Um, I, I'm constantly amazed at how dirty my kids' feet get here in Dubai. I have to wash their feet every single night. Guys, time to wash your feet. Um, but here's the reality. It isn't my children's greatest need. And it wasn't the disciples' greatest need, and it definitely isn't my greatest need. And Jesus came not just to wash our feet, but to serve us in our greatest need. And in Matthew 20, verse 26, he spells it out for us. He says, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and here it is, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The foot washing, it pointed towards, it foreshadowed the most important, the most humble, the most sacrificial act of service that Jesus could ever do and did ever do for humanity when just a couple days later, he would willingly go to the cross for our sins. See, Jesus knew our greatest need, and it's this, to be reconciled to God. And for this to happen, he knew that we had to be cleansed. Not just our feet, but we had to be cleansed. Our sins had to be dealt with. The death and punishment that we deserve for our rebellion against God, it had to be experienced. And Jesus says, that's why I've come, to serve you in a way that no one else can, to serve you in a way that you can't even do yourself. I've come not just to cleanse your feet, but to cleanse your life by going to the cross for you so that you don't have to. 
Jesus, or, or John says this in his first letter, this is how God showed his love among us. This is what it looked like for him to love us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God because we don't love God. No, not like he loves us. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Isn't that amazing? Because, because of his love for us, Jesus came to meet our greatest need. Friends, don't miss out on this. Don't miss out on the service of Jesus. He wants to serve you. He wants to provide a life for you that begins today and goes on for eternity in relationship with God. And if you want to receive that gift and experience that service of Jesus today, please reach out to us. We would love to journey with you and walk through that with you so that you can be served by him. But the heart of it is simply acknowledging your sin, acknowledging not just your dirty feet, but your dirty life and the sins and your rebellion and your need for cleansing and forgiveness. And just calling out to God and saying, God, let the sacrifice of Jesus, let why he came and how he served us, let it apply to my life. Believe in him, friends, and receive this gift today. Best decision you'll ever make in your life. Don't miss out on that. Well, as amazing as that L is, and I hope it does amaze you, it isn't the end of the passage. And there's one more thing that Jesus does not want us to miss out on. Let's look at verse 12 again. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for this, that is what I am. And now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, now that I have served you, now that I have humbled myself before you, here it is, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an, uh, for you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. What is he saying here? Jesus, their Lord and teacher, and the disciples as the subjects and the students, Jesus gives them an assignment, and the assignment is this, to serve him by serving each other. He's saying, as my servants, I want you to pick up a towel and to do what I've done, to give your life away in service to others. Now, think about the logic here that Jesus walks through in the passage. It's pretty logical. If Jesus is our Lord, if he's our king, what does that make us? It makes us his servants, right? We see this understanding and this posture throughout the authors of the New Testament over and over again. They refer to themselves as servants. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. You see the theme here. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. So who are we? We are servants of Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus said, says in this passage, no servant is greater than his master. Are we greater than our master? Of course not. No, we're not greater than our master. Well, what did our master do? He served us, didn't he? And so what are we to do? To do for each other what he has done for us, to humbly pick up a towel and serve others. Friends, this is why ultimately God has us in Dubai or wherever in the world that we are right now. Not simply to do a job or to increase our education, those aren't bad things, but that's not fundamentally why we're here. Uh, not just to uh, improve our CV or expand our careers, again, not bad things. Uh, not just to make money to send home to family as beautiful and loving as that is. And not simply to experience a new culture or a new way of life. Or whatever brought you to Dubai or wherever you are in the first place, whatever brought you there, God has us here for something else. To pass on what we've experienced and to serve him by serving others. And so that's what we do here at Fellowship. As Christ's servants, we serve him by serving each other. It's actually one of the four quadrants of our growth engine. You saw this a, a while back. Um, if you wanna grow and mature here at Fellowship as a follower of Jesus, um, this is what we do. 
We gather together, we worship together. Uh, we grow in community in our 242s and our small groups with one another. We are equipped for life and for service through our courses and classes that we offer. And fourthly, we serve. We serve each other. All right, so that said, how do we serve in fellowship? What can it look like for us to do this as a part of this church family? Well, I think it's helpful to think about this in two different ways, okay? Firstly, as a posture, and secondly, as a role. So posture, what do we mean there? Think of a family, think of a family for a moment, fellowship, we're a church family because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Whether we like it or not, we're family. Uh, and so think of a family for a second. There's actually um, a posture that's needed for a family to flourish. And the posture is this, if we see a need, we meet it. If you see a need, you do something about it, right? So in a family, if you're walking down the hallway and you see a big piece of garbage on the ground, you don't just look at it and say, nah, that's someone else's job, and we keep walking away. No, if we see a need, we pick it up, we put it in the garbage, get on with life. Uh, if someone in a family says, hey, could, could someone give me a hand with this? And they're trying to carry a box upstairs. You're not gonna say, ah, someone else will get it. No, you're gonna, you're gonna say, hey, yeah, I'll give you a hand, right? I realize some of you are probably thinking like, man, I wish my family functioned like that. I get it, okay? This is an ideal family. But here's the heart of it, this posture. And it's the same posture we have at fellowship, is that if we see a need, if at all possible, we do something about it. Uh, and it's actually hard to live this out if you don't know people, which is why we encourage everyone to be a part of a small group at fellowship, whether online or in person. But, you know, if someone in our small group expresses a need, uh, we do what we can to help meet that need, right? We give them a ride. Um, we lend them a hand. We, we encourage them. We listen to them. We pray for them. We, we seek to serve each other. Um, if we meet someone in our day-to-day -day lives, maybe at our job or in a taxi or wherever we go who's, who doesn't know anything about Jesus, uh, we take that posture of a servant and we tell them. We tell them about Jesus. What a, what, what's a greater act of, of service to someone than that? To tell them about the God who came to serve them. In short, we have this posture where we wake up every morning and say, God, I'm a servant of yours, so I'm available to be used by you to serve others today. And then we live that out. So that's one of the ways we can serve in fellowship. Just having this posture, this attitude that says, I'm a servant of Christ, so I serve others. But as part of the fellowship family, just like in your home, there are many unique roles that help the family flourish. So at home, someone's job might be to cook the meals. You know, other people might help, but maybe there's one person that really owns that. That's their, that's their job. Someone's job might be to pay the bills. Someone's job might be to get some, the kids onto the bus in the morning. There's all sorts of roles that help the family function well, right? Same thing at fellowship. We serve the family here by owning a specific role in the family. Get this, did you know that between our, our in-person and our online ministries and all that we do throughout the week here at Fellowship, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 people every month that serve others in a unique role. Isn't that amazing? So we got, we got musicians and, and vocalists and, and tech people that help us to hear and see things, and you can watch this today. You know, we got people serving in, in our family ministries and our children with our youth, with our, our preteens. We got people that, uh, hundreds of people that serve as small group leaders or as hosts to small group leaders or to small groups. We have dozens of equipped teachers, people that teach our classes or volunteer to make those classes happen. We have people who, you know, online you're watching, we have people who serve and volunteer their time to be online hosts as we have these live stream services. There are so, so many ways that people serve in a role at fellowship. But what's truly amazing is not that they serve, it's why they serve. Just take a look at this video and hear from their own words why they serve. I think serving brings people uh, makes people connect, you know, connect with God and connect with others. I look forward to coming to church on Sunday, not just to be taught or to listen to the to the sermon or to be part of the worship, but also um, the fact that I get to to serve other people. It was because my dad, who was serving with the church, 
I, I stayed with him at that 7 p.m. service behind the tech desk. At first, helping with tech, it is very, it's, you feel scared or nervous. That fear can, it goes away because it becomes fun. I immediately serve because I want to be deeply rooted with this word because we just me and him and just um, going for the service every Sunday. It doesn't make sense. So I wanted to be deeply, be deeply rooted with this word. Now we realize it's just about facilitating and serving the group. We make sure that the groups are involved. It's not sitting there and us talking the whole time. No, it's not servanthood. Uh, the Refugee and Relief Ministry, uh, that's that first and second trip to Jordan really made a, uh, an impact on our, yeah. our lives. And what we're doing now is a result of the opportunities that Fellowship gave us. We have the refugees that are coming into our center and we want to be hospitable to them. We want to serve them, whether it's just a cup of tea or a piece of fruit, mm -hmm. um, a warmer place on a cold winter day, mm -hmm. we have that opportunity. And it's a really great way that we can show Christ's love to them, that we can say, yes, Jesus was the king of the universe, but he also served. And here's how we want to serve and love you just like he loves you. We want to be like Jesus, you know? We're striving towards being like him and wanting to meet him one day. So our main goal and our main, our main view on life is, you know, what does he say? What does he want us to do? Doing tech is also important in a way that Jesus works through that as well. It is up to us, uh, followers of Jesus, to really follow his footsteps. We are his hands, his feet. The days I'm serving, by the time I finish, I get home, I am elated. It's not because I have won a million dirhams, <laughs> but oftentimes I just get this deep satisfaction that I have done what I'm supposed to do. His love gave me the opportunity to serve others because if you don't have love, you wouldn't serve anyone. The love that he gave me made me choose to serve as well and to love others. Serving is about sharing the love of God with others. People serve in all sorts of ways, don't they? We just saw a bunch of examples there. And sometimes, you know, we may look at those examples and say, well, I couldn't do that. I couldn't, I couldn't do what they do. Or we think of other things. Well, I'm, I'm just so busy. I don't have the time to serve. Or, or I'm just not gifted. Or, or I don't live in Dubai, so how can I serve this family? Or they've got lots of people, so maybe they don't need me. But let me tell you this today. Every follower of Jesus has been saved to serve. Every single person. And so there is a place for everyone at Fellowship to serve. No matter what your age, your education, where you live in the world, uh, what your availability is, there's a place for everyone to serve Christ by serving others at Fellowship. And so if you've yet to do so, I want to encourage you to do one simple thing today. It's just especially if you consider fellowship your home church, but it's simply just to make yourself available. Just make yourself available. You may not know what to do or, or what that'll look like, but just, just take the first step to pick up a towel, so to speak, and to say, how can I serve? And the way to do that um, is simply through this, this form and this link that we have available. It's a way for you just to let, let us know who you are and, uh, and to start the conversation. It's not you committing to anything at this point. It's you just saying, hey, I'm so-and-so, and I'm willing to serve because I'm part of the family, and I want to have a role, and I want to serve Christ in this way. And so um, please do that. That's the one simple application to how we can obey Jesus who teaches us to do for each other what he did for us. But listen, if you already serve at Fellowship in some way today, I just want to say one thing. Thank you. Thank you for being the hands and feet of Jesus. Thank you for serving our church family so faithfully. Uh, we want to say keep going strong, you know. God is using you. He is using you to share his love with so many people. And so, well done. 
Keep going. We are so grateful that you are part of the family and that you serve in the way that you do. We love because he first loved us and we serve because he first served us. This is why God has us wherever we are. You know what? It's a blessing to serve, isn't it? It is a blessing to give our lives away for the sake of others. I love how Jesus finished off this passage and this whole teaching moment with uh, his disciples and he said this, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You know, we don't serve others in order to receive God's blessing, but Jesus does make this promise that when we serve others, when we pick up a towel and humble ourselves in this way, it is a blessing to us. So let's not miss out on experiencing the blessing that God has for us. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much for how you came, not to be served, but to serve us and ultimately to give away your life for ours. And thank you for this call that you've given us to, to serve you by serving each other. And as a church family, God, we wanna obey this and we wanna live this out well. So we pray today that you would help us to put our hand up, to make ourselves available, and that you would help us to figure out where the best place is that we can serve our church family. And we thank you for the promise that it is a blessing to serve. So we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen.